All right. Um, it's time to get started. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Jonas. We'll uh, have the simplest session of the day. Um, the, but the downside of this, that thing is that it's the hardest one to implement in real life. Uh, let's start off with a couple of questions of you. First of, the, first of all, the most important ones, in it, since it is the morning of the last day of the DrupalCon, how many of you went out last night? All right, so we'll try to keep things interested, interesting uh, <coughs> and then to keep you awake. All right, other demographic questions about you. How many of you consider yourselves developers? All right, less than half. Uh, are there anybody here who consider them or have a, as a part of their job being system administrators? All right, some. Are there people here that consider them some sort of management or team leads or something else? Great, seems like we have a very good audience for, for the session. Okay, let's get on with the actual stuff. Uh, First of all, a short introduction about who we are. Uh, we are Jonas and Ilari from Wunderkraut. Wunderkraut is the largest Drupal consultancy in Europe. We operate in nine countries. The most recent one isn't colored yet because we just signed uh, the contracts with Estonia this Monday. Uh, we're, we only do Drupal um, as a technical platform. We only do agile projects when it comes to project, uh, software projects, but of course, uh, what we do in um, the uh, <coughs> maintenance and support stuff, it's, it's also agile, but not agile as in scrum agile, but different kind of and smaller, smaller kind of agile. And we're also a, a very agile company. Um, I've been on Drupal.org for six and a half years, I think. Why are you looking at me? I don't know. <laughs> Just thinking. Well, since 2007 anyway. Uh, so that's five and a half. I don't know. Six and a half. Um, I'm the managing director of, of Fundokrat Finland. We're 35 people uh, in Helsinki and Turku. And I'm a part of a lot of our projects. I do steering for them and, and try to get away, uh, myself away from the the kind of not disturb the actual valuable people too much. Okay, and as Jonas introduced me, I'm Ilari. I work currently as a service manager, uh, and in my job description, actually, is all three that mentioned here: development, uh, sysadmin, and more, most of the times nowadays, more of the management side. In the previous life, I work at the University of Helsinki. Started at the low level of help desk, so I know what it's to do in the, in the client, uh, getting all that nice stuff from the clients. And I, before I worked, started working with Drupal uh, around three years ago, I, I worked and I still currently work with WordPress also. So I'm in, in, it's still an open source, source site. All right, that, that's the thing about us. All right, we had kind of a humorous uh, topic in the session saying that we want to create uh, vendor lock-ins and of course as you know in the actual open source world that doesn't happen in the tra traditional world uh, vendor lock-ins is when evil proprietary systems or not e necessarily evil but pro uh, proprietary anyway uh, customers get get stuck with uh, certain companies certain vendors certain uh, service providers because the service provider owns the the software or they're the only one to support that. So sometimes um, that's a bad thing since the vendor may uh, produce really bad quality, really bad customer satisfaction, and the customers are, are paying too much and they're not able to be happy with the service that, that they get, but they're stuck. They can't switch away uh, at least anytime soon. Uh, the stuff that we're aiming at being open source um, vendor lock-in is trying to get into a position where our customers are so happy with us or they trust us so much or they kind of feel um, emotionally or, or mentally addicted to us so they can imagine switching away 
uh, but it, well, of course they technically always can. Uh, websites evolve for years. So from the user's point of view, even if you did a um, big project, um, then finally got your service to the public and your project ends, the website is zero days old at that point. Means that as the website uh, evolves and, and runs for years, the um, whole customer satisfaction or the whole experience about whether the uh, service uh, is able to, to serve the needs of the users or, and the owners is made during that uh, longer period of, of time. So not the first couple of months, but the upcoming years. Next one. All right. Those of you who admitted to being uh, developers and not so much the other two kinds of people that I asked uh, might think that they don't want to do hosting and support and, and maintenance stuff because they want to create new things. That's fine. We have a lot of those people as well. We probably have even some of those guys from Wunderkraft in the room. That's fine. Not everybody has to. But of course, that's even more a reason for um, creating a, a system where, where you have a team of people that, that, that are dedicated for that, that are motivated for that, and that are really good at that. Uh, from the company point of view, maintenance is really important because it's really good for your business. Um, it's steady cash flow, as whereas projects start and end and then you're kind of um, unemployed again. Um, they're a great thing to create upsell opportunities because you're in contact with customers all the time. You know what ha what's happening at the customer organizations. And one very important thing is that it's kind of the only tool, only powerful tool to control your brand value as a Drupal company or even an, as an internal team of, of developers. Because as I said in the, in the previous slide, when you do a project, when you finish a, a project and the service launches, it's zero days old. And, and if you would do a great project, that would bring a lot of value to the customer, but then it would be maintained by somebody else, hosted somewhere on a crappy server. Uh, the, it wouldn't be a good kind of showcase for you. So it's best that you, you're the best one or the go-to company for um, hosting and uh, maintaining the sites as well. Other aspects to having a great support team is that it's great for internal support. It's great for the people in your company or in your internal teams that don't do the life cycle parts or the, lo the, <coughs> the support part uh, in your, your project since they are the kinds of people who get what you did wrong in the project uh, or so what somebody else failed in a project when they forgot to put caching on views or whatever. So they can help uh, the developers uh, not repeat the same problems that previous teams or previous projects have done. So in that sense, they're a quality assurance factor in the company. And of course, um, our support guys are present even before we start actual implementation projects because they are already in the RFPs. We're selling them uh, as a part of our offering. So they're uh, having good support, having good continuous development is a competitive edge for us. And uh, uh, of course, we want to keep it that way. All right. Um, it's stupid to try to invent all wheels yourself. So we're um, proudly saying that we've stolen some of the ideas that we have in our, in our maintenance from other industries. Um, this is a quote that I stole from Zappos.com. Zappos is a really uh, well-known online um, shoe store, basically. And what they say in their about.zappos.com is that 
We've been asked by a lot of people how we've grown so quickly, and the answer is actually really simple. We've aligned the entire organization around one mission, to provide the best customer service possible internally. We call this our wow philosophy. And this is something that we've tried to um, adapt to Drupal um, services as well. And now I'll turn the, the mic over to, to Ilari to show how it's actually done. Ilari, go ahead. So basically what we have at the moment in Wundercrowd, we have this theme called Humu, which means actually to smile. And this is the, thing, uh, the, the tool that we use to uh, handle the hosting and the continuous development, all these tasks in, 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 in our company. The beginning of all this was so that in the beginning it was just me doing all the stuff. There was no Humu team. And of course, you all know when businesses start, one person can do certain amount of stuff. But when you get new clients and the clients, uh, the projects end, you get more and more stuff. And, and at that point, one person isn't enough anymore. Uh, we, we came to that point at some point around, I say, a year ago or a bit, bit over a year ago. And that was the crossroad where we also decided that we want to do this as a competitive advantage for us. So at that point, uh, we decided when we added one more person to the team, we also decided that we are going to uh, roll out a, a whole new philosophy for doing things. So uh, at the moment, as I said, we have a five-man engineering team. So it has grown up from the one, one man. And, and, and the only purpose that we have, even though we all are technical persons, we have sysadmins that's, that like to be in the terminal and do tinkering and stuff, and we have performance addicts who like to see if it's one milliseconds faster or slower and so on, but the most powerful tool that we want to do is to make smile, customer smiles with great communications. If you don't have great communications, it's something that even though you would do excellent technical things, if you don't communicate it right, the, the level of happiness of customers, it, it can't get up enough so that you get a competitive advantage of your hosting and maintenance and continuous development. Uh, as, as we are, as I said, the great communications, the communications is something that's really, really, really hard. Uh, I would say that Jonas is a very good communicator, but he has every day, every day he has to learn new things. He isn't perfect either even though he thinks so. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it is, it's a true thing. Even, even though you are really, really good, you need to understand that you need to constantly learn in communications. You meet new people, you meet new organizations. None of them are the same. They have maybe some, same, same uh, stuff in there, like in the organization, they may have same kind of management, but then again, they have whole different kind of things under, underneath that. Uh, another another uh, great or uh, really important thing, as Jonas already mentioned, is that we are uh, in the whole process, like starting from the from the when we meet the clients and so on, we start also introducing that we have this very very great continuous development hosting maintenance team, and the actual idea is that our team, one one of the members or several of the members, are in somewhat involved in the project from the full, whole beginning. Because if we wouldn't do that, it would be like, you know, day before launch. Oh, 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 wh where are we going to host it? Where, where is it? Where's the server? Where's the server? What, 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 what are we going to do? And that would be the case with the development team. Instead, we are there, we see, okay, now they are in this phase or something, and we help them like, okay, now we have to think about this, we have to communicate to the customer, and these are the things that we need to do. And at the same time, when we are there, we are also doing internal QA. So uh, you might say that we have seen all the bugs that you have done before, and we don't want you see, to do them again because we have to fix them. So we will say that, hey, don't do this again. This is bad because of this. And happily, our, our developers are smart enough not to do those bugs again. So that's, that's a real compliment for them. Thank you. And, and uh, the thing is also our fi philosophy is, is to fail fast. And, and fail cheaply. So that's also part of the philosophy that we bring the information back. Uh, also, like, 
as I said, we provide the value to every uh, stage of the, uh, the, the project and customer partnership. We provide it also to the customer. We say that, hey, maybe we could do this way or something so we can, we can actually affect things all, already in the project phase that affect Nor, like normally start like week before we are going to production, we can already start the affection in the, in the beginning of the project phase. And that's, that's really, really important also. So basically, when, when, if, if you are in a phase that you are in the same crossroads thinking about that, okay, now, now I need more people here. I'm, it's just me or it's just me and my bud, buddy Joe or something. We need to think about this is something that you, you need to think about. The, the team has to be involved from the beginning. Okay, and this is, uh, this is actually something that the whole HUMU team started off from this example. Yeah, before actually going into the example, I'd like to point out one more thing that, that Ilaris team is very, very valuable to, our, to us and the customers uh, alike. They're protecting all the development teams from interruptions, so whenever there's an issue or there's a bug or there's a change request or whatever that comes from from other clients or other services that are already online in production and and there's a ticket that comes in and somebody some, something needs to get done Ilaris team will be the buffer to handle that and nine times out of then uh, out of ten they can handle it without ever going to the original development team so that they can focus on whatever they're doing at the moment um, without being interrupted and without having those really costly context switches in their, their work. But going to the, the server crash example, as Ilari said, this is actually the kind of exercise or talk that we, we had the, the very day when we decided to, um, to form this human team. And, and we actually constantly still have it, like when we fail in something, we remind us by this example, what's the actual point of the whole team. Yep. The, the idea is that there are two websites, two identical websites on different parts of the internet, but they are managed a bit differently. Uh, what happens is that both of these sites crash because let's say PHP, FPM, jams and monit can't and bring it up healthy again whatever the site just crashes it becomes unresponsive uh, in both of these cases there are um, monitoring in place so both of the teams ma managing the the sites get for example SMS alerts saying that example.com is is now down the first team um, stops doing whatever they were doing, starts fixing the problem, sees that, all right, I'm going to log into the server, or first verify that it's not working, logging into the server, um, doing whatever needs to be done. And then the customer calls, that, hey, our, our site is down, it's been down for at least 15 minutes. Where we say that, yeah, yeah, okay, we know that we're already actually fixing it, so, so be calm. The customer hangs up the po phone, we, and the, we fix the issue, and the downtime is, in total, it's 30 minutes. All right, here's the second team from other side of the, the internet. The site goes down, the development or the maintenance team goes to verify that it is actually down. All right, there's a 503 on the, on the page. They SMS the customer, saying that, hey, Marku, there's a problem with your site, it's down, we're fixing it. Um, then they start fixing it. Um, it takes 30 minutes, they fix it, and then they call the customer saying that, yeah, there was a problem with the server, um, but it's now back up, and we actually change the configuration of, of the surveillance software so that it can now be um, brought back to life uh, without any human interaction. At the end of the day, both sites were down for half an hour. Uh, so technically, they were very similar cases. But the first case um, made the customer first notice a problem themselves. They had to call us to make sure that we're actually doing something, and we didn't report. In the second case, 
the customer didn't know that their site was down, but they know, knew or they noticed that we have um, surveillance systems in place. And after the 30 minute downtime, they felt even more comfortable with us than they did um, the previous morning, because they knew that we fixed the problem, we fixed it really fast, we told them in human terms what the problem was, and we made the server environment better. So even though, if, even though the site was down for 30 minutes, the customer satisfaction in us is actually probably higher than it would have been without the crash. So communication is, is the key. And for the next exercise, you might want to dig up, dig up your pencils and pads because there's the important thing. Okay, so this is, this is really important. Be ready. This is the, one of the key elements. So as we, as we talked about, uh, as Jonas said, recovering failure, you might write, to write this down. It's, it's really, really hard. Actually, it's really hard to implement, but very hard to think that, okay, I will do this. So the idea is basically, as Jonas said, before you do anything. Of course, you, you can go and log into the, see the site, it's actually down. Then communicate to the customer. Then you, then you can act and do, start doing this. And actually, if it's going to take long, just repeat the number two and three, act, communicate, act, communicate, act, communicate. Because this is something, if you don't, if you communicate in the beginning, then you act and then you are silent for three hours. The client is again, what are they doing anything? Are they on a coffee break? Are they on the lunch? Did they go home already? You need to communicate constantly on that one. And of course, as we have the fourth point, victory, I think that every time you, there's a failure on a customer's site uh, application or whatever, that's, uh, that's a possibility to get your, your customer more happy, your reputation up, actually. You don't have to fear those. Of course, you have to, when you're fixing it, you have to fix it so that it doesn't repeat, because that's another thing that's, that's repeating failures and that we don't want to do. But single failure isn't bad in a sense that, that it's, it's an opportunity to make everything better. And of course, a uh, very important part of this is also that you, uh, every failure you do, depending on the size of the failure, you do a retrospective after that. What happened? Why happened? Uh, what are we going to do uh, to prevent, prevent this happening again? That's also really, really important. It's, it doesn't have to be more than five minutes if it's a really small thing. Don't spend too much time. Don't blame people. Try to find solutions, try to go forward. Another, as I said, uh, the communications is a uh, very, very uh, big part in our, our, uh, our, our organization and in, in, in the client communications. It's not the technical tools. And this is more in the continuous development side, not that much in the hosting and maintenance. But you know, customers, they have these they things that they want. And we all know that that those things, most of the time they sound in the beginning, they sound ridiculous because oh, we shouldn't do it this way and so on. That's why you should and always ask why to actually understand what the customer needs, not the, what, what the customer wants. It may, uh, it, it may be irritating for the customer in the beginning if it's a new customer and you start asking like why, 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 and they have used to the things that they send a request to the, the, the technical company and they implement it, know what, how, how stupid the idea would have been. And then they might say, okay, we got something or, okay, this wasn't useful at all. But when you start asking why, then, oh, why, are these, why aren't these just doing like the other companies? But the, also the, the idea behind, behind the asking the why is to educate the customer to think more through only, and then your job in the future will be more easy also. When you, when you ask why, you can, you can repeat the, the, the whys, like to understand the actual, the business value, the business reason behind the, the request. And this is also, uh, as to the topic for the vendor locking, this is very, very addictive thing. When you start doing this and the customer notices at some point, hey, these guys actually, they care about our business, not, not about just their paychecks and the, the things that they can bill from us. 
it's 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 a whole another like uh, atmosphere in the communication, and there you can start building the vendor lock-in, open source vendor lock-in, and it it requires certain kind of mindset. You have to be patient. It doesn't happen in one week or even in one month. But it's when, when you start it, you start it from the project phase, or if you get it just for hosting, you start it immediately doing when, before you even sign anything, you start doing this. So it's more easy for, for you, more easy for the customer to adapt this new thing, because I think it's a very new thing. Not many, many companies do this. Uh, and as I said, as many companies don't do this, you can position your on top of those companies, be the next level company, be the one that understands the client's business needs, because you are the one who understands, uh, is the expert in the technical part, but the client is expert in their business. But you need to understand their business to provide the right technical solutions. Uh, as I already said about this fail fast, fail often, it's, it's, it's our methodology, not, not just in our continuous development team, it's, it's our methodology in management, it's, our, it's, it's, it's in the whole organization. Whatever we do, we don't fear failure. And you might think that, hey, why to fail? Why just not, you know, always succeed in everything you do? Well, first of all, that's impossible, we are humans. And, and second of all, uh, I think that if you don't fail, ever fail, you are not trying hard enough. And if you are not trying hard enough, you are not going forward. And if you are not going forward, somebody is at the same time passing you as a company or as an individual, and that's another good thing. Uh, one thing, as I said about the retrospective, is about also about the failing. So. Uh, we try to fail transparently inside the company, but also outside the company. So if we fail in something, we are very open to communicate it to the customer in a way that we don't like put ourselves, uh, ourselves like low in the level, but we try to be open and say that, okay, we are humans too, we made a, make, made a mistake, but we have fixed it, and we have, we have also made the, the, the things that it won't happen again. That's just positive influence if you are open about that. Then also, that's, that's, uh, that's a part of the building, the, the, the relationship, building the trust between your client. You are open to them, and at some point, they will start being open at you too. Uh, and, and the fact is that, at least in our environment, and I think in every environment, like, uh, if, if, you, if you don't, like every time somebody fails, you don't like pinpoint, oh, it was that guy who failed or that guy or that one failed and it was his fault. But you say that, okay, uh, you are allowed to fail. But remember, just fail once in that subject, learn it, fail fast, fail cheaply. And that encourages productivity in your, in your company. You may start happening, making new things, new innovations, people actually are with their whole heart in the, in, the, in the business doing that because they know that they are cared for. They are not blamed for every mistake that they, they do. They proceed uh, further with their experiments. So you get the, all the cool new things and get the, the business advantage compared to other companies. And as I said about the openness, we have actually a tool for this. We call it fail of the month. And it's, it's basically for this uh, the biggest failures that we have, we kind of like cherish and, and in kind of way celebrate these, but also try to make other people learn out of them. All right, great. Everybody still seems to be pretty much happy. I don't see anybody snoozing. Uh, let's go, to, go through the, the tool of fail of the month uh, through an example. This is a customer of ours. It's called Uusi It's an online-only newspaper in Finland. It's one of the biggest uh, online newspapers that, that Finland has. And it's the only professionally run online-only uh, newspaper that the country has. And they had an issue, or like most newspapers, or the, all the big ones had an issue between Christmas and New Year's last year. There was some group of people that did a series of uh, distributed denial-of-service attacks. And um, 
a customer of us, Ushisuomi, was one of those. They got hacked on the, or not hacked, but, but DDoS on the 28th of, of December. And there was an issue on, par on our part with that. And that's, of course, not the fact that the site went down, but the communication that followed. This is an actual document on, on how we managed that failure last December. So with all the typos and all the names and all the company names and everything in there, it's, it's an actual document. So the background. I said on 28th December after midday, Ursum news site was DDoSed, like many other media sites during the couple of days around that. Site was down for 30 minutes for regular users. Uh, the issue was solved when the internet service provider who hosts the servers started restricting foreign traffic to the sites. Some minor issues existed still one hour after this. But basically the site was down for, for 30 minutes. We couldn't access them, nobody could access them because of that. All right, then in, in detail what happened. We got an alert like two minutes before one in the afternoon that automatic monitoring noticed notified our support uh, about an issue. Um, five minutes after that, we confirmed that the server was uh, unaccessible and started to find out what the probable cause was. Four minutes after that, we called the, the server service provider, the hosting service provider, and told them that we can't even access the servers, we can't uh, access via SSH to to find out what the problem is, and neither could we access the the management consoles of those service servers, so we kind of thought that this is probably a network network issue. Um, so we called them and then asked them to to have a look at what happened. Uh, Thirty minutes after that, the internet service provider gave us information on, on that that there's a lot of traffic coming to the the sites, and they're they're seeing what they can do about it. 40 minutes after that, the service provider had restric restricted foreign traffic, uh, which made the site accessible within Finland. And then, probably we can see the next part. Wow, animation. <coughs> so what went wrong? The customer contacted us 11 minutes after we were contacted by, by the, the SMS from the monitoring service. And the customer told us that there was something wrong with the service. Um, we replied, I, th I think they filed a ticket in our ticket system, right? Something that runs like that. All right. So we responded six minutes after that, that we're working on it. The problem that was wrong with this was the whole server crash example thing that we started the whole team with, and then we failed in that, that uh, thing. But I think we've learned now. That hasn't happened since. So communication was the problem. Customer contacted us instead of us contacting, us contacting them. We've already been working on the stuff for 10 minutes. We could have told them that yes, there is a problem. Yes, we're working on it. But of course, in the heat of the moment, it's really easy to remember or forget that there are other people in the internet or the, in the universe as well. Um, as said, there is a four-step guideline. You know, remember the uh, communicate act, communicate victory. Um, the first step stating that we should communicate the situation to customers right after we confirmed the issue and we failed to, to follow that. We managed the failure. After initial delay in communication, we informed customers regularly about progress. Lessons learned, even if it's sometimes easy to forget, we are here in the customer service business, not solving technical issues and making sure this never happens again. Mistakes do happen, but it's important to acknowledge the failure and uh, acknowledge the failure and learn from that. For our team, writing this is one of the steps on learning about this. We're also, we also share this so that others can learn from this. For more information, contact Henry and Janne, who sit there yeah. actually. Yes. <laughs> um, we sent this out to all at wundercrowd.com and to the customer. That's what we usually do. So inform all the people that need to be informed, including the customer. And usually what happens when we send this out to customers, Ilari? What? What happens when you send these uh, reports? Uh, 
they, the customers at this time, even though, uh, for example, this time, the customer actually was really happy that we did. And they were like, oh, oh, we were really happy even though we did a mistake in there, but we fixed it at the time. And after that, the customer actually said, hey, this is really good idea. We are taking this into our internal use. Yeah, so. it's, and it's the same thing that happens with most best practices that you transparently show to customers. We've had reports on them, them saying that that this daily meeting thing is a really good thing. We have an internal daily, daily meeting in our communications department now or, or that sort of thing. So be very transparent on the good things that you do or how you do them well and people will steal them proudly. Okay, this concludes the content of our session and I'm hoping that this is at least one thing that everybody has to take away from this session. If you still drink, think if you still drink. <laughs> How many of you drinks now? If you still drink, Drupal support and maintenance is a technical job. You weren't listening. You're, you're not doing it. You're, doing, you're approaching it the wrong way. All right. Do you have any questions or comments? You can ask now. Great. I'll bring the microphone. You can ask now ask on Twitter or come to a bath session we're hosting in a room right after this uh, session ends. But we yes. probably can find the room. And I also asked uh, Scott Massey who had a similar kind of session yesterday and he has at least yesterday said that he would be coming also there. So we can have uh, good, good, good conversations there. So right. please do arrive. But for questions. What's the process that you use to communicate the support lessons back into the rest of the team? Uh, like you mean, like internally? Yeah. Uh, well, it depends, of course, like in, in, in how, what kind of uh, problem or, or, or pro thing is this. Sometimes we just go and walk if the team is there uh, and walk, walk and talk it with them. And if the thing is important that we see that uh, it's something that everybody should know. After we have discussed it with the team in Skype or 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 uh, face to face, then we communicate it with email or or in Skype or however to the whole Wonder Crowd, so that we can. If if we fail in Finland, then we hope that if we say to the Belgium, the Belgium Belgium guys won't fail fail it. Uh, after that, we have informed them that hey, don't do do, do this. This is stupid. So, so it's we, just case by case, it's not a... Like yeah, but basically we, we try to do it every time so that we inform the whole wonder crowd about it. Or if it's a dev problem, we don't might want to say to the management, but we try to, to, to bring the message to the all developers that don't do this, this is bad. All right, uh, adding to that, one of the processes that we have in place for, for spreading the knowledge is that we usually... Uh, dedicate or nominate a person within the continuous development team uh, to project teams. And they're a person that's responsible, kind of follows up on what they do, make sure that when they start their project, they use the right tools, the most up-to-date tools, because the tools change every three months, and, and make sure that their, all of their technical infrastructure is done right. Um, and follows up on the performance issues or or whatever best, practice issues, best practices issues there are uh, to make sure that um, project teams learn from other project teams even while the projects, both projects or uh, various projects are going on at the same time so we can kind of shorten the, the learning cycle. Um, my question was gonna be virtually similar. Um, I run teams and what I found um, is that didn't work for me. I was just wondering whether my approach, you'd ever kind of considered it and dismissed it or, 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 or not. So what I do is I actually s tend to split my dev teams up um, and have a rotating rotor for the support team. So the support team is the dev team. They're the people who develop the latest release. Because what I've found in the past is that, yeah, you can em embed what is essentially an ops person into the, into the development team, but they really have to be working on the code base um, to even do a release or to support any issues that come up. Um, and then you still have that kind of slightly siloed approach. So what, what I do is I have a, you know, if I have, I don't know, a dev team of 10 people, then I might split them up into three and seven or two and, and eight or something like that. And after every release, 
the you know three people from the devs team kind of spin off and they're the support team for the next you know two weeks four weeks or something like that and then if they want to keep doing it it's fine if not they can merge back in because the other thing that tended to happen was that people sometimes got a bit of demoralized about you know being stuck on support and it's a bit less interesting than being in development have you thought about that any problems with that or you know comments from from Wunderkraut? well i'll let eli speak in a minute but uh, wh one of the reasons Five why minutes. <laughs> Hilary, don't be like that. one of the reasons why we have this team of course one one of the, uh, the one of the things is the customer facing things but the other is that we want to do this as good as possible internally as well. And we have people that are really good Drupal hackers or Drupal people. And, and they, they're saying the kind of thinking that if they, would be the, if they would need to be nominated to that team for more than two days, they would probably start finding a new job. And sometimes we've had issues trying to convince people who we want to be a part of the team that no, you don't have to be in the team forever. Uh, and no, it's not a second grade thing. I think that's the best team we have. They are responsible for most of our um, customer satisfaction, even more than the people that build the applications. But as far as your question goes, still remember it? Some part of it. <laughs> uh, Basically, like I understand that what, what you are after that, but uh, I, I and we, we see it so that we have to have the core team that has the, the part of the knowledge like in everything. So we, we don't have to, every time you get a new team inside, they have to learn it. It's the same thing like in, in projects, when you bring a new team member inside, you know that it doesn't accelerate it with 100% or something like that. It's the same thing in continuous development. But as Jonas said, we do it so that we have, like now we have five people, but we still have more work than for five people. And of course, we cannot do so that people move from projects to projects to projects to projects. There are like week, maybe a month, but they are not doing anything billable. So then we use those people from projects maybe to the old projects that they have done because they know it already. So we circulate it in that way that we get people still from the project, but we have the core team that knows the current situation and the new, new, new guy who comes for, for two weeks or something, he knows the technical side and it's really, really fast to brief like what's the current situation, what we are doing and so on. So that's, I think that the way it could be working also for you. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be big in the beginning, the, the continuous development team, but the knowledge has to be somewhere all the time. Nice talk. Um, I have a business questions which might link with your company, as well as uh, market of Drupal and Drupal maturity. I'm new to Drupal, I'm managing a, a research lab, private lab, but uh, it's on telecom. I'm working on telecom, and this uh, telecom market has been maturing in a way that uh, basically you cannot tell I'm a you know, telecom shop like you could find a Drupal shop on the market. You have, I would say, players which are segmented on different, I would say, activities for different group of users, and that's the only way to survive in this, I would say, uh, competitive market. So my question would be uh, about the why that you mentioned. Uh, key things for you is to understand the business of the customer. If you go deeper into this uh, kind of uh, question, then you might have competitors in the market who come with people that would upfront understand the business of the customer. And they will not only ask why, but they will also, yes, I do understand why you're doing that. Can you give me some little more details about how you are implementing this? Meaning that you might be in a way, on the market big enough or Drupal mature enough to be able to segment your offer into specialized areas like banks, retail, anyway. So do you think that uh, there's a maturity on the market big enough to do that right now or it will be a longer time? i let the honest to answer that. Yeah, it sounds like a question that I should answer. Um, whether there are really good business consultants in Drupal no, we 
aim to be as good as we can be, but Drupal companies uh, in general are pretty small and they're pretty gen generic. They build a lot of different kinds of sites. Um, it's it's really nice thing to see that there's, there are companies that are focusing on commerce and, and companies that are focusing on different things. And there are a lot of companies in the in, in America that are focusing on, on uh, not-for-profits. And, but yeah, um, if we would have a case which would be a big case for, let's say, a French bank, we probably would uh, seek out help from a kind of a traditional business consultant and, and team up with them, partner up with them, um, try to understand the business of the customer together and try to um, develop that or, or do new ideas for, for that together and then just seamlessly handle that as one team. That, does that answer your question? that the market is not still much enough uh, in front of the US, which is maybe more advanced. Yeah, if the, if the biggest professional services c company in Europe is less than 150 people, then no, we can't uh, be able to, to manage all of the different uh, customer verticals in all of these different markets. More yeah. questions, we still have time. Uh, a follow-up question for earlier uh, regarding the support team and uh, customer communication. So if the uh, support team is already involved when uh, the project is, is, is built, uh, how do you handle like a single point of contact for the customer if they have contact, for example, with a project manager, but also with a future support team? Do you, how do you do that? Do you do that? You want to take this or me? You can, because it's, it's more like, again, your, your area. All right. Um, and how do we manage the, the issue of having a single point of contact? Well, from the engineer's point of view, there is no, because the single point of contact is usually the guy or one of the around two guys who first met the customer and discussed about the RFP. And the single point of contact usually is that person. But when you enter a, a kind of partnership with a client and, and they have uh, operational daily needs, for example, fix the Twitter feed thing or, or something like that, uh, they don't want to contact the business analyst or, or that kind of a management person to say that I want this technical thing done. That's why we have a service manager. So they know that, that there is no single point of, con points of contact, there's actually two. So one is on a tactical level and one is, one is on a strategic level, kind of. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And, and also, uh, additional to that, uh, when we do it so that we have two points of contact, we, we also see very fast, like, oh, this question should go to the business analyst. And for example, if it comes to me, I say, okay, I will, uh, I will pass it to this guy and he will contact you as soon as possible. And so we are trying to com communicate and not do something that we, for example, the business analyst is not the technical person. And he admits that, so he forwards it back to us. So that's, that's the way how we rotate that one. Hi, um, I have one question. Uh, I like the, the kind of transparent nature of this. However, does it ever set un, un, ex, like unreasonable expectations with your clients about how you'll do other work in the future, about change requests being done immediately? Uh, because it's, it's great having this kind of really good relationship with your clients, but without offending people, not all clients are very reasonable sometimes. So is there a point where this kind of process maybe sets unrealistic expectations or causes problems in any way? Uh, well, of course, like if, if you communicate, when you communicate the customer, you have to always, starting from the project, you need to have the, the, like the expectations management. Every time you communicate, you have to think about that. So uh, in, in, in all phases, if you, if, I, I would say it, it falls back to in, in all phases to expectation management. So you, you need to have, when you communicate it, when you are transparent, when you do everything, you need to be like alert on, on how this would affect. And you will probably, most probably to see it, like when, when you get the, the knowledge and this kind of thing, you gradually get better and better. And then and you get from the smallest pieces that, okay, now this could go to the wrong side and we need to start communicating it differently. Did I answer at all to your question, or? Yeah, no, yeah, you did. It was sort of an abstract question, but I'm yeah. curious yeah. if you have one. Yeah. Thing. So, so, 
yeah. So it's it's about uh, all all the times it's about the expectation management. You have to see so, like like uh, the, the the thing that if you get like a, a layout from some other company that promises something, that's then you are like it's really hard to start the expectation management. But when it's all it's in your, inside your company, it's easier. And if you do it all the time, it gets easier and easier and easier because the customer also gets like uh, educated all the time. Like how is this done? Hi, I'm Gretchen, and uh, thank you for the great presentation, first of all. Um, I work for Drupal Squad, and we handle a lot of maintenance contracts. Um, not all of them do we have the luxury of being the project developers on. So as we uh, transfer knowledge from other organizations um, as the supporting uh, team for our clients, it is often turbulent. How do you have any advice or best practices to maintain client satisfaction during that sometimes challenging time? So you mean when the other, some other company has done the implementation and it comes to you? Yeah, so um, we need to be ready immediately to support uh, their platform and their product. Um, meanwhile, challenged with uh, good knowledge transfer yeah. Um, sometimes causes the client to not always be uh, patient or happy. Yeah. Do you have any advice? Uh, uh, how we do it that like, of course, at some point you, you start having, you have these trusted companies that you know that they do good quality, but then you have these unknown companies like small Drupal shops that you don't know before. They might be really good or not that good. So one thing that we do if we get a project, we, uh, we do an, a Drupal audit for the site. So we, we can guarantee that it is. And it's something that after Drupal audit, we give uh, the, the results to the customer and say that to be able to provide our great support and our, our, the, the top-notch level stuff that we deliver, these things need to be done. And one point can be like, hey, there's no documentation, high risk. We don't know what has been done. Or like like one of our develop, developers is like very 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 interested. Like if there are no comments in the code, that could be a really bad thing also. So I would advise to do an audit for the site. And and if you cannot do it, uh, excuse me, if you cannot do the audit, uh, it's it's really risky business because then you are risking the stuff that you will just get the black box of something and then it will be dumped in your stuff and who yeah. knows what happens after that. Yeah. In, in short, you have to do an audit before taking taking an application that somebody else made under your kind of wings and protection, because you're giving them an SLA, you're giving them a, them a monthly fee in, in which you uh, promise to take care of the site, and you have to know the site first. So uh, if possible, do a Drupal audit uh, with the company, the other company that's handing that over to you, willingly or unwillingly. But anyway, um, do an audit in cooperation with them don't blame people, just try to find the weak points and, and advise, or tell the customer how to fix them or how much money they need or how much time they need to fix that and then start the support contract. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you use some kind of ticketing system or support system? Uh, if you do, what is it? Uh, this again uh, comes to the philosophy of our company in the sense that uh, we try to do things as simple as possible. So at the moment we use just simply open atrium with a couple of little tune-ups there. So basically clients, it's like we say it's the bottomless barrel of their like dreams and whatever. So clients can't enter there anything that they want, like help desk request, uh, continuous development requests. So. Uh, and and uh, for the help desk request, of course, we answer like during the contract and so on. And for the continuous development request, we have created this one nice little tool, which is simply just prioritized list. So there can be in the continuous development side, client can enter like one hundreds of things that they want to develop, and, but they have to keep it in prioritized order. So there will be only one the top one priority, then then number two priority, and so on. And it makes it makes easy for the customer like it's they they will uh, they will organize the list for the, based on their business needs and, and we have already made list for that yeah 
for the developers in the room, Dragon Ball of Use. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of the difficult customers. I, uh, uh, I have a, uh, I'm managing a uh, multi-site platform, um, and as the project manager, I'm actually trying to write to step back and write myself out of the uh, the project a little bit, um, and try and I'm trying to figure out how to be, how we can r continue to be a good customer, maybe a little less stressful on you, and burn through our hour, our support hours a little more slowly. Um, and we're trying to assemble sort of a group of admins for the various sites that are on the platform, um, and build some sort of knowledge base. We're still working on the workflows and the procedures. And uh, and what, what I'd like to know is how we should best interface with our, with our vendors, our hosting and our development vendors, uh, in such a way that we can be good customers as, effe as effectively and efficiently as possible so we're not burning through uh, tons of hours with redundant requests from multiple sites. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Whether we have a silver bullet or not? No. <laughs> But, I don't know, just speaking in general terms, when you have a cooperation with this, you need to have a shared goal with the vendor or vendors that you have with the site or sites. Um, so be transparent, be human, be personal, and, and try to talk from a, as, as a person to person. Uh, try to find simple ways to go around problems that seem difficult, but a silver bullet, no. So, so uh, what I would say, as, as I'm uh, on the other side of the fence, we would say, uh, like, start showing about the open communication, start building the trust from your side. And what you can do, can do is, like, to have, like, some kind of, if you have several sites and you have, we say, like, we could have, like, product owners, like, for, for each site, a, a different person is the product owner of the site. Try to do it so that, uh, they would collaborate inside your organization so that you would have also shared goals so that you wouldn't, every, as you said, there wouldn't be multiple same requests at the same time. So that helps at least. Or have one person, they might be in your company, they might be one of the service providers, have some person who has a re responsibility of, of minimizing the redundancy. So watching these different development queues, doing something like that, having that as a part of their job. Um. I have a real question. Um, so my team, until very, very recently, just a, like a month ago, I was, um, we were looking up uh, after a, a bunch of publishing sites, and there's a bunch of content editors. The one thing that I've mentioned that hasn't been said before is if you're planning, that's really good. You know, what we want to build is a tool for your guys to do their jobs. We don't want you to come to us all the time to, to you know, make every little change. But you need to start talking to your, um, to your dev team, to your vendor right now about this to make, because especially with Drupal, which stores kind of configuration and th there's, no, there's no hard distinction between content and, and development, or not as hard as in other systems. So you need to start talking to them now because what your content editors do can really step all over the dev team and then you're going to have you know constant battles between the two and all but you know the latest release blew away our thing but we didn't know that you did a thing so that's kind of it okay uh we have time for one quick question were there any more left and we have a ton of time in the buff session yes. if somebody wants to come um going back uh to the um, to the failure reports uh, a little bit. Do you have uh, a system or a method to make those, uh, to, to consult those things for, especially on, on such a large scale as, as with you? Uh, do you mean like internally? Internally, yes. So, so I mean, the con consultability of, of, those, uh, of those reports, or is it just like lists of them and, and you can just consult them in it? And oh, well, basically what we do, as, as I said, we send the failure like that the whole text to the whole company and after that if we see so that we still need to explain it in for example in more developer friendly way that the developers actually need to do it then we will do it the methods are free we do it maybe skype email whatever but it, it's per case 
the situation. If if the, the fail of the month isn't enough, of course we try to do it so or we do it so that we will explain it to devs so that they understand it also from their side. Yeah. So basically there's no big system or policy in place. We have kind of a document template that states the, the titles in the in the things, like not just describing the problem but how to learn from that. And and then kind of have the culture of people stepping up and, and bringing up their, their failures. So, so that's just bringing together like, like the question and then... Yes, repeating that, bringing up the, the question and, and bringing up the kind of the solutions for, for doing it. But hey, um, thank you. Please thank do you. and rate the session on, on the Drupal site so that the Drupal Association knows how to have good sessions. And, and, and we, we know how to have good sessions. Yeah. Um, for those of you who want to continue, we have a buff somewhere. Follow us. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.